Okay, we're going to shift gears. This is going to be our fireside chat without a real fire. And we're really delighted to have a special guest with us here today. Teddy Beckley is the Chief Technology Officer at Lando Lakes, and he'll be joining me on stage. So again, Teddy Beckley is from Lando Lakes, up in Minnesota, as he said, coming for warmer weather down to Illinois. You know, we're a vacation destination, apparently. Um, it is if you live in Minnesota. <laughs> Land of 10,000 lakes and the origins of the company name. Um, Teddy has a really interesting story of how he got to be in this role. Uh, his life story, I found one to be very interesting to hear about. And so before we get into what he does and his leadership as an executive, executive at Lando Lakes. I thought maybe he could start by telling us a little bit of his upbringing, which started in Ethiopia and ended uh, in Italy as a child, and then eventually brings him to the States to, to be in college. So, uh, Teddy, can you share a little bit about your experiences growing up in Ethiopia? Yeah, happy to do so. And uh, thanks for having me, first of all. It, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and a real honor. Uh, and I love, this is, this is the type of, you know, instead of doing presentations, this is probably one of the, the better formats for me, and it's easy to tell my story. Uh, so I was born in Ethiopia. Uh, my dad was uh, uh, an agronomist uh, first, and then he uh, eventually became a farmer. He farmed about 400 acres of corn, wheat, and cotton. Uh, this was about the early 70s, mid 70s, and then about the late 70s, a dictator took over the country and nationalized the land, which meant all farmers lost their land overnight, and they had really three options. Number one, you know, you can quit farming. Number two, you could uh, uh, work for the government, but your income was always unknown. Or number three, you got shot if you didn't you know, abide by those rules. So most farmers took you know, door number one, they quit farming. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so when they quit farming, uh, the, the country went into uh, famine and crisis and all kinds of things you read about Ethiopia in the, in the 80s. Uh, my dad stayed in agriculture. He actually ended up buying uh, crop protection from, uh, uh, from Bayer in, 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 in Europe, uh, and as well as manufacturing equipment from Fiat in Italy, and then sold that back into, into, into Africa and Eastern Africa. And in the mid-80s, we actually ended up moving to Italy because the situation got pretty bad in Ethiopia. And, um, and so that's the environment I grew up in, right? So it was around agriculture, it was around sort of this, we had a farm and then we lost the farm and then he did crop protection and, so, and had business. And things got crazy when, you know, between uh, the European bureaucracy and then the uh, African corruption, he had a lot of bad deals go through. So he just struggled throughout the, the 80s. So I remember when I was going to college, uh, you know, we had this uh, deep conversation about what are you going to do when you, you know, when you graduate college? And my dad asked me that question, and I was ready to answer, but it was a rhetorical question, right? He said, there's two things you are not going to do, right? He said, one, you are not going to get into music. <laughs> and, and, I, and I looked at him, and he's like, you're just, you're not very good. Let me just be honest. Uh, actually, if you have the exact translation, it's like, you're not worth a shit. But, you know, uh, that, was, that was my dad. Was, yeah. Um, and then number two, he said, don't even think about agriculture. Right? He said, uh, uh, it's been rough. I, he, he loved farming. Uh, he loved everything about there was about farming and, and, and the whole industry. But he just said he struggled. So he said, go be a lawyer. Go be an engineer. Go do something else like that. And that was one point we agreed upon. So I, was, I went to school for mechanical engineering. Uh, I loved cars, wanted to build cars, and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, somehow I ended up into, uh, um, uh, into more industrial manufacturing, uh, uh, power generation at one point, and then industrial manufacturing. Got into technology during the dot-com days. And I won't say it was foresight knowing technology was coming. Uh, really what had happened at the time was I joined this company and they had this dot-com team. And it was really trying to mimic what Silicon Valley was doing. And what they were trying to do was, um, you know, really kind of how do we figure out this internet thing, right? Um, and I joined that group because they were allowed to mimicking Silicon Valley. They could wear t-shirt, shorts, jeans, and all that. And I was 24 years old. It sounded awesome. So I joined that group. And then two years later, things went bust. Um, so that, you know, that didn't kind of work out that, that way, but there was, I had a mentor that said, if you stay in agriculture, or if you stay in technology, uh, things will, uh, you know, like, the, the, it's, just, it's just a speed bump. Uh, I listened to that message, 
uh, got into coding and then project management, business analyst, everything else you can run by IT. Um, and then after that, really uh, kind of uh, kind of flourished in that in that role. And really is when software made it into mechanical products. That's when things got interesting, right? So we made large air compressors, large air conditioners, uh, door keys, and somehow sensors made themselves into these mechanical products. And then you could build a UI on top of the data coming from that, and then make decisions not being where the equipment was located. So uh, that kind of got me into an interesting role and had a really fun uh, job at the Ingersoll Rand, and spent 15 years there. And then I had this friend that was at Land Lakes and said, hey, based on kind of what you're doing and this whole technology thing uh, becoming bigger in the industry, um, I think it would be interesting if you came to look at Land Lakes and what we're doing in agriculture, in animal nutrition, and even in the CPG space. And all I knew Land Lakes for at the time was for butter as probably most of you, right? Uh, I didn't realize that they, you know, the, the big agriculture side of Land Lakes, and everybody was, at the time, you know, if you're at Land Lakes, you'd love to talk about, yeah, butter is awesome, we love it, keep buying it, you know, it's great for us, but everybody wants to talk about the other stuff, like, you know, hey, we have bigger company in ag, and all that, thinking when they were telling me that, that I was gonna be excited about it, and I kept looking at them like, yeah, this is not the company for me, you don't understand, agriculture was out of the cards, you know? Um, but I really had a, 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 a the gentleman that ran our business at the, the, the ag business at the time sat down and said, technology will become a competitive advantage in agriculture. And that's why we want to invest into that space. That's why we want to recruit talent that really has some background in it, can understand it, but also could have a passion for developing technology in agriculture. And I remember those words, and it got me inspired. I remember coming back to the hotel room, and my wife thought we were just taking this fun trip to Minneapolis in the summer, and that was it. <laughs> we're going to go back to Charlotte, and life would be great. And I walked in the room, and she looked at me and goes, oh my god, don't tell me we're moving here, you know? <laughs> and uh, we did move there. She, she didn't know what the winters were like, and to this day, she still looks at me every winter and is like, mm, this, was, this was a fun choice, you know? So, <laughs> I am at Land Lakes now, I, I truly enjoy it. I am blessed every day, I enjoy every minute of it. I love the idea of bringing technology into agriculture. Uh, you know, the 15 years of experience I had in sort of a different environment, bringing that into ag, developing solutions, working with farmers like my dad who passed away actually a year after we moved here uh, is a real honor and blessing to me. And, 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 and I can see like, you know, the, the work ethics and truly the, 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 uh, you have this greater purpose to, to, to serve society and, uh, and, and people live it every day. And, and, and it's not just in the, I mean, obviously the farmers, yes, they, they're number one, but even the whole industry around that really has that, um, that feeling and, and I love that. So enjoy every minute of it. So it's a fascinating story, and before we dive into the technology and what you're doing now, let's go back a little bit. Some of the things that you shared were about your father's influence, which I thought were very interesting, about him being a small farmer and how that still makes you think today about the importance and how you serve small farms and uh, treat the land. Being adaptable, you talked about that he had to pivot and change a variety of times, become an entrepreneur, get into new businesses as well, and be able to move his family to be able to do what was best for them. You share a little bit about some of the those things or the political influence that you went through that maybe shapes a little bit of your mindset today as you approach business? Yeah, great question. So yeah, I watched my dad, right? So he, he lost, when he lost the farm, I was two to three years old. So I don't, I don't remember the farming side of things. Uh, but then he got into, you know, kind of selling crop protection. And I remember him bouncing. Uh, he was sort of, uh, he didn't work for a specific company. He worked for himself because, you know, as a farmer, like you have sort of that mindset. I guess once you get the, the, that, that becomes your part of your DNA, it stays. And so he wanted to work for himself, so he would work with these companies. So it was Bayer at one point, the Cyanamid, for those who remember that one, uh, Ron Polanc, which is another company out of France, uh, and just you know dealing with different cultures. So you had, you were working with Germans at the time, and the French, and then the British, and then the Americans. And so, he, you know, it, it just seeing him sort of interact in that space, and then he got into equipment. And so he was buying Fiat, which is now part of Case IH, and, um, or, kind of the other way around, but Fiat did have its own agriculture equipment. Um, dealing with the Italians at the time, that was, that was real fun. Um, yeah, we can have a side discussion about that one. And I, am, I, I spent 10 years in Italy, so I love, love the country, but there's a lot of things there. Um, and, uh, it, you know, and so, and, and the languages you had to learn, right? So, I mean, English obviously used that, but then you, you know, German and French and Italian and, and all those languages kind of being around that and figuring out how people would communicate and how adaptable my dad was. And I remember at one point, you know, he's deep into all the ag stuff, but then he was thinking, you know what, I, you know what Ethiopia lacks? Like, we don't have enough bicycles, <laughs> you know? 
and he wanted to look into how to bring bicycles into the country. I mean, it's true like farming style, right? Like, cause I mean, I talked to farmers today that are truly entrepreneurs and they get into a lot of different businesses, right? From something that's close to them, like, you know, they might be uh, dairy producers and they're uh, now making ice cream, right? And selling it at games and things like that to, you know, they, they get into completely into different business, into trucking and, 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 uh, and you know, having a, a fleet of, a fleet of two or three trucks and they move them around. So it, that mindset was in my dad as well. And always trying different things. And the one thing I'll give him credit to for, and this has shaped me quite a bit, is his love for technology. You know, he never said he loved technology, right? Like he would say, oh, this technology thing is ruining our lives and all that. But he was always willing to try the new thing. Like we always, you know, and the, you know, he had the, the, the telex came out and then the type, we moved from the typewriter to the word processor to the computer. And I would say that even shaped my life because I remember the day we got a computer and he got it and he was all excited about it and said, yeah, learn how to type on this thing. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and, and I thought it was fun because I could play games, but then I didn't realize that what the job entailed was every single letter that went out, I had to type it, right? <laughs> and so I learned typing like, at, you know, I was middle school and I was typing stuff for him and all these like agricultural letters which meant absolutely nothing to me at the time. I, it was like typing a foreign language and now I look back at those letters and it's interesting because it actually makes sense to me. But, um, but yeah, so that's kind of the environment I grew up. So it really, uh, one, shaped me from the fact of like, you know, don't be afraid to try things, uh, embrace technology. But at the same time, just the, the, the idea that you always have to constantly look for the next thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the next thing? How can you think beyond just sort of the conventional thing you're in today, but uh, look, look beyond that a little bit? And so that, that really has shaped my mind and how I look at technology even today. So speaking of looking at the next thing, you've had a career that included working with Winfield, which is a division of Lando Lakes, in an information technology capacity. But then along came a year and a half ago, a really dynamic new CEO of Lando Lakes. Beth Ford joins, and she saw an opportunity for the next thing of the company. And yeah. she speaks a lot about disruption in the business and the digital future. And she smartly decided that Teddy should become the chief technology officer. Can you tell us a little bit about how Land Lakes has changed in your history of being with the company and where you think it's changing and pivoting to in this new era? Yeah. So I joined Land Lakes about uh, seven years ago. And the way I came into the organization was in the Winfield United Group, which is the crop input side of the business. And I came in as the CIO, like the CIO for that group. Essentially, you manage the IT budget. Those are all the system, network, security, everything you think of IT, yeah, that, that part of it. And then they had this sort of tiny portion that was ag technology. This is seven years ago, right? And, but they said, this is the piece that we think is growing, and that's kind of why we want you into this role. Um, so you fast forward a little bit, that, that sort of small part of the budget became a bigger part of the budget, but it became a bigger consumption of my time. So I was spending 90% of my time on that and only 10% on the traditional IT stuff. So at one point when we wanted to scale the technology and the adoption of it and how we develop and really kind of have a focused attention on it, the leader of the group decided that we were gonna create a PNL just for ag technology within Winfield United. And I ran that PNL for about two years, uh, and, and you know, like we're developing technology. We're out in the uh, we're out in the field, working with farmers, working with retailers, looking at adoption of the tool. How do we incorporate it to our greater business? And I was having a complete blast, right? I mean, that was the best of both worlds, where you bring in the IT stuff together. I'm dealing with sort of business issues and uh, adoption issues, and I, I loved all that. So one day, you know, Beth Ford took over as CEO 18 months ago, and I, I remember, you know, she was she was in the job about a month. And I was driving back from southern Minnesota back to Minneapolis, and I get this, uh, 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 there was a text, text message uh, from Beth that says, uh, can you talk in about uh, 10 minutes? <laughs> My answer is yes, I can talk to you in 10 minutes, you know? You don't wanna say no to that. So she calls up and says, um, hey look, uh, we're making some changes, you know, obviously we're changing the leadership team, and we want to, what we've done in technology within Winfield United, how technology has become part of the DNA of that organization and how we go to market, we want that to be sort of the model for all of Land Lake. So we wanna figure out an animal nutrition business, which is Purina, how do we use technology in that business to be able to start to complement the business, but then eventually become part of the business uh, and, and, and make that digital transformation. And same on the dairy side, right? So the dairy side, there is a CPG side where we actually make the butter and sell it into stores. But up front, there is working with the dairy producers, which are owners of the Land O'Lakes Cooperative, at least part owners. 
And um, we, we take the milk from them, and so they have to manage their cows, and we bring that in. And then, so how do we use technology in that space to make them more efficient, more profitable, uh, more sustainable? And so that was sort of the, 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 the premise of kind of creating this new role of a chief technology officer. And it's kind of an interesting role because it's, um, it's a combination probably of a CIO and a, which is chief information officer and a chief digital officer, right? So you put those two together and that's, a, that's the intersection of those two uh, roles where I actually literally feel like I have two separate teams, right? So one is the traditional IT, which by the way, I wanted to stay away from that and Beth was like, no, no, that comes with you. Uh, we want to use the horsepower of that organization and the knowledge that they have uh, to be able to infuse that into more of our business counterparts or your business counterparts. Um, so I also have a team of these, you know, trying to transformation agents, right? And they're agronomists, marketers, customer service, uh, sales in some cases, a lot of field folks. And, you know, it was really fun to bring, you know, IT folks together with agronomists and see that, that interaction, which didn't go very well at first. Um, but over time, it's fun now to see how an agronomist has become more tech savvy and talks IT and watch an IT person be more agronomically, like make those kind of conversations and discussions. And uh, that's actually a rewarding process for me. So that's kind of how the role is set up today and, and, and how that, what's called chief technology officer is for, is for that reason. And in that role, you've started working on some really cool new technologies as well. So some of them that we had the chance to talk about was using voice recognition that farmers can pose questions and get answers or things like um, computer vision or video monitoring. Tell us about some of the hot areas that you think are exciting that go beyond just traditional IT and look towards the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's when even actually when I realized Beth's vision was correct because when we start talking about emerging technologies, right? And so, I mean, I'll put artificial intelligence at the kind of higher level overarching uh, theme there, uh, but you kind of break that down and you get into machine learning and there's all sorts of advanced uh, reinforcement learning and deep learning and all those things you can get into that. Uh, and you know, you can create crop models from that. So, well, or natural language processing, which kind of using voice or computer vision, kind of seeing the, you know, like the machine actually seeing something. That's when the technologies and the technology folks got excited, right? Because they wanted to mess around with that technology and applying it to a, a real world problem in farming was something that was exciting. So, you know, we obviously have a set of tools today that are, you know, we've used remote sensing and modeling and all those types of things, but we are starting to explore a lot of these other areas of artificial intelligence. So the natural language processing to me is one that uh, has a lot of potential. Uh, we're still at the very, very early stages. So how many people in the room have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home? Yeah, I'll see most of you. It's interesting because you go to a farmer crowd, the, the hands go down a little bit, and then I'm like, don't worry, go get it. It's not, it's not that dangerous. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, it, the, the conversations are becoming smarter every day, right? And, and if you think about it, the device, the hardware doesn't quite matter. It's the software behind the scenes. And like I said, it's early stages because you're asking a question and you're training the machine to be able to answer in a certain way. Now, it happens really fast because you have to understand your intent. Um, but you could see how in farming, this could go uh, a variety of ways, right? So if you're a farmer, you could be in the cab or you could be at home and start asking questions, how are my field doing? Uh, which one is my worst performing field? And the machine can ask and answer with those, with those, with those, uh, with those answers, right? So, um, and say, you know, this is the field that has the most issues. Here's the type of diseases that are in the area. So we're kind of uh, playing with that and starting to see uh, how we create the right conversation so it doesn't feel awkward, but it's things you want to ask. And the idea is let's uh, stop the touching of the buttons, right? So, which is a little bit of a barrier to adoption in some cases, right? Because if it's on the phone, that's not that bad, but if you have to get on a computer, pull up a map, click seven times before you can actually get to the answer, you might not do that as often as you think. So using voice becomes a much easier way uh, to be able to interact. Um, but the one area we've actually had the most success and the one that seems to be most promising is we have this thing called the crop protection guide, right? And so this is what goes out to our uh, district sales managers as well as the ag retailers and it's a book that's about that thick and it has all the chemistry in it with all the crazy names and then all the active ingredients and all the modes of operation and all that. And People, I mean, you have to, if you, if you actually see an agronomist with this book, they have all these sticky notes that kind of <laughs> stick out of it and they have different colors so they know like for this type of active ingredient, this is the page I need to go to. Oh, and for this mode of action, this is the disease that it, 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 it solves. And what you can do is you can actually digitize the whole thing and the agronomist can just ask a question and say, 
what's, uh, you know, what's the best uh, uh, herbicide for crabgrass? And they would say, here's the five of the list you can pick from. And what's the mode of action? And you'd say, well, this is the mode of action of the five. And, and, and so then you can all of a sudden, instead of having to hold that book experience, you can actually digitize that, um, that, 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 that whole experience. And by the way, it was inter interesting about that is that we actually tried to digitize, like put that book on an iPad and it never worked because you could never like, you know, those sticky notes you had out and the, the blue one, and you're like, oh, let's flip to this. That was always faster than flipping through the iPad or trying to go through the table of contents and all that type of stuff. So we can see how my voice actually starts to accelerate that a little bit. So I'm really interested in voice recognition technologies. We see a bunch of it out at the research park. And we've also found that certain industries had to retrain the whole vocabulary. So although Amazon and Google have vocabulary that is um, natural language for many people, when you get into a specialty area, sometimes you've got to start from scratch with your own sort of dictionary of terms and phrases. Are you encountering that with agriculture? And I'll give us an example. One of the companies we work with is Brunswick. And boating terms don't work with some of these. Do agronomous phrases work, or are you building that out from scratch? Um, no, a lot of them do not. Some of the co more complicated names, I mean, you don't think you could stump Google Home, uh, you know, Google Assistant or Amazon, but you can't. It all of a sudden starts to say the name, and it comes out and sounds nothing like the way it's supposed to sound. Uh, so no, so some of those key words, you have to retrain that. Uh, what's nice about, uh, and, I, and you know, both platforms, but even the Google more so than the Amazon one, I think, is the, uh, everything else comes along with it. So all you have to do is try train them on those vocabularies and what those things mean. But as far as understanding the intent, uh, the different ways to ask the question, like all that is sort of built into the, uh, the platforms as they come today. Now it's how you put that together. So you have to actually construct uh, the way you code for that, or at least you, you put it together, is a little different than coding where you do normal coding because mm -hmm. you actually have to think more like a person and what is the question that's gonna be asked and what if like, you know, you, let's say you set it up in a sequence of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this is at the question number seven is going to be this. But in, in reality, it may not be that way. Like you might actually get to question number five, and then you want to ask question number three again, and then then the whole thing goes, you know, <laughs> haywire because it's oh no, I, I can't answer that, or I don't know what you mean by that. And it's like, wait, you just answered that a second ago. How do you know what you mean? What it means again? So, uh, so you have to actually d define the whole conversations, which is super interesting. Another neat technology that you were describing is talking about traceability and the future potential for blockchain. Um, it's an exciting area. A lot of companies are starting to dabble more so in the fintech areas than ag. But what do you see for the future and how it'll improve your supply chain performance and, and traceability? Yeah, so that for us is a specific, uh, not necessarily the technology, but the whole concept of uh, transparency and traceability becomes important because we're actually a farm to fork cooperative, right? So we have our crop inputs business where we sell seed, crop protection, plant nutrition, and then you have the animal nutrition business and a lot of the output from the crop input side, right? So corn silage alpha alpha goes into the feed of animals. And if that animal is a cow, then we, our dairy producers own those cows and they produce milk and then that milk then turns into butter and cheese and then you find it at the store. So truly we have that gamut from end to end. And so we start to see these uh, trends from consumers uh, about you know, wanting to know where their food comes from, right? So, I mean, people are a little bit, you know, the organic and natural and GMO free. I mean, we can, we can argue about that all day long, but uh, we actually had recently a panel of Gen Z folks and the one thing that did resonate with them was the whole concept of environmental sustainability. Like if, if you, uh, if you uh, follow uh, steps that are environmentally sound, um, if you have those practices in place, that's the company I wanna buy from, that's the type of food I wanna uh, consume. And so we, we hear that and more and more. And so how do you then enable that sort of transparency or traceability, right? So if you're gonna go buy a, a box of cornflakes at the store, where did all the ingredients come from? Well, first we have to, what, what ingredients are they, but where do they come from? That becomes an interesting aspect of it. But even for us, you know, if you go to the, if you buy a stick of butter, you wanna know like, okay, where did, where did the butter come from? Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, and so enabling that is, there's, 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 uh, it's key, but it's not easy. Right, it's not easy at all. Like, and I would say it even in the milk to butter piece of it for us is really difficult, let alone grains, right? So grains, we know that you, know, you have, you produce a corn or soybeans from a field, but then multiple fields get combined. By the time it gets to the silo, there's more even, or to the grain elevator, there's more mixing that happens from there. So if you wanna trace something back to a specific field, it's gonna be very difficult. But we have to start, right? Same thing on the dairy side for us, right? So you have two dairy producers that start to produce milk. 
Um, the minute our truck comes around to pick up their milk, if you picked it up from two dairy producers, you already mixed it in. By the time it gets to the creamery, it's even more mixed in. So we actually call them like uh, uh, blockchain blackouts, right? So you just don't know what happened there, right? Uh, but you can make some assumptions. But we started out with this whole concept of transparency. Mm -hmm. So I actually, that's the thing that also consumers were talking about is that, you know, I, I trust farmers. They actually have an absolute trust in farmers. They like to be closer to farming. But then, you know, and their food comes in the store, but in the middle, they feel like there's this black box, like don't know what happens. I don't know about all these chemicals and preservatives that are in the food. Don't know why they put them in, you know? And so, and we, I can't understand the label in the back when I read it. And so therefore, like, I automatically assume, because I don't know it's bad, right? Or it's not good. So when something comes out and says natural, all of a sudden it's like, that seems like it's better for me. But if we had more transparency in the practices that we have along the way, and kind of open up that black box and really show what happens, then we can start to show a little bit of um, um, uh, kind of how the steps work through and then, and then you can get to maybe traceability. Now the traceability aspect of it becomes expensive because you'd have to separate out bins and make sure you track things all along the way to make sure you can capture the data all throughout the process. Um, but if consumers are willing to pay more for that, we can absolutely do it. So we start with transparency and then kind of tackling this area of, of traceability and blockchain becomes an enabler for that, for that capability. So it seems like Lando Lakes, as a CPG company, maybe has a different perspective than many of the other ag companies because you're still, you're touching consumers and seeing that pull. So I think it's really interesting as you've described. I'm going to shift gears on another topic because not only does Teddy have this role in leadership at Lando Lakes, but he was also tapped because he's an expert in many areas, as you can hear, to become the chairman of the FCC Precision Agriculture Connectivity Task Force, a federal task force looking at connectivity issues across the U.S and these challenges of rural broadband or other types of connectivity that might be related to 5G or other connection points. We heard a question on that earlier today from USDA. What do you think about this and how are you bringing together different partners to help address this challenge? Yeah, so this is, this is a big challenge, right? And, and, uh, and, and connectivity in rural Americas, and I, something mentioned earlier, like, you know, you sort of have the, the map covered and then you have the you know, kind of the blank spots and that's where farming is. That's absolutely true, but I would say even the areas that are covered in a lot of cases, that's they just say like, do we have signal that could potentially reach in that area? That doesn't necessarily mean there's coverage in those, in those spaces. So, but I, you know, in the last seven years, just working on ag technology and trying to take that out to the field, the one thing, you know, you, know, you, you work on this app and you, or this application and you, know, you put your heart and soul into it and then next thing you take it out to the farm and it doesn't work. And the farmer goes, well, your thing doesn't work. And it's like, no, it works. It just doesn't work right here, you know? And like, but it's not a fun conversation to have, right? Because it's like, well, like, this is the connectivity that's here. And, you know, and, and when we did some of the analysis, you know, there's 24 million Americans today that actually don't have broadband, even in their household. Forget the actual fields, even the household. And there's of 19 million of the 24 are actually in rural America. So that became a bigger issue. And then when you look at uh, whether it's uh, precision agriculture or ag technology being used that, using that on the farm, but then you kind of go a little deeper and you look at rural communities and how about telehealth, right? Like your hospitals are far away and so is the doctor, but we could use telehealth, but if we don't have connectivity, that doesn't work. What about the kids going to school and they want to take AP classes? There's not enough of them to uh, create a class, but you could do an online course. But if the connectivity is terrible, even at the school or at home, then you can't, you can't make that happen. Uh, we know consolidation is happening, so a lot of farms are consolidating. If those are exiting it, how do they reskill themselves? Can, can they take online courses, et cetera, et cetera? So this became a paramount problem that, as a cooperative, we had to get involved in. The Congress, actually, in the last farm bill, said that you know we need to take a look at this problem and had bubbled up enough to where they wanted to put a focus on it. And so essentially tasked the FCC and the USDA to create a task force made up of individuals that are not in the not, not in the space of, uh, of telecommunications, but sort of had expertise from the outside to come in and make a set of recommendations about what are the needs of, of, of uh, rural te the technology or um, broadband capabilities in rural America. Uh, where are the underserved areas? Can we improve some of this mapping capabilities that, that seem to be a, a, a hindrance today to, to providing the right coverage? And then, you know, what is the, the, you know, what's the adoption rate look like if we had the right technologies in place? So we have about 14 individuals, talented individuals on this task force. Uh, you know, it goes from SpaceX to John Deere to rural uh, uh, telco providers to rural uh, electrical providers that are on the task force. We have some uh, folks from the Farm Bureau. 
And our goal is to you know, get together. We get together about three to four times a year. Uh, those are just the meetings, but we actually have meetings almost every week uh, to tackle these four problems. And so there's a group coming together looking at that, and we're constantly working with the FCC and USDA to provide initial recommendations, but then uh, more concrete ones in, in about two years. Well, I think it's incredibly important work of all of us who have heard this challenge, um, but also, as you said, for the impact it has on kids that are growing up in these communities. And the workforce of the future is going to be important. If they have to go to McDonald's to get internet in their town, that is hard. We hear kids that are using their phones because their computers don't have a connection, and so that's the only way they can write an essay, yeah. something like that. Um, as you think about skills and we wrap up this discussion, what skills here at the University of Illinois do you think are most important for us to be training the students for the future to be able to implement all these great ideas you have in mind? Yeah, so I, I think you know, one area, and, and it's interesting, it says ag tech right behind me. Um, if you have an ag background, you know, getting into technology, uh, that's, that's a phenomenal way to get someone who's got sort of the, the know-how and the expertise of just how the industry works, and then getting trained in more of a technical space, and a, or in computer science, or electrical engineering, or whatever that might be, but then still want to go back and maybe focus on agriculture, uh, I think that's a, that's a great way to, to bring up talent. But then the other way around, what if you're somebody who lives in an urban area, gets a technology uh, um, uh, 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 degree, like in computer science or whatever that means, but then have a focus on agriculture. And that's why the research park, I think it's a, it's a tremendous asset to have here, because that's an opportunity to bring folks that may not be in agriculture, uh, maybe have, like, have never had any touch with it, but now have the opportunity to be able to contribute. And as we look at you know, going forward, a lot of the jobs in, in, in agriculture are not gonna be in the farming side, right? Like, so you're still gonna have the farmer, you're still gonna have somebody who needs to run the operations at the local level, but as more the machinery becomes uh, automated, as we start to use more algorithms and somebody's gotta decipher what the algorithm does, well actually who creates the algorithm? You're gonna have folks that sit in a central spot that can answer <laughs> phone calls really quickly. You're gonna have folks that develop the technology, and so that ecosystem is gonna change, and we need talent that can fuel and, and bring that energy, that knowledge, and, and, uh, and, and that, uh, that excitement and expertise into those, into those domains. Well, you're definitely part of the story of making ag cool. So thank you, Teddy, for in giving us all your insights. I think we could keep this conversation going. He's such a brilliant leader, and we're really um, excited to have you here today. So thank you for sharing your perspective. Absolutely. No, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate the time.